Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and if you're already a member of this Weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com where you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Minds, MeWe, and more, along with the Weird Darkness Weirdos Facebook group. Coming up in this episode, today is June 13th, and it was on this day in 1977 that the brutal murder of three Girl Scouts took place at Camp Scott near Locust Grove, Oklahoma. As horrible as that is to hear, the investigation took many twisted turns, including the possibility that the murderer was a Cherokee Indian shapeshifter or skinwalker, and leaving behind a campsite that has not been used since, filled with ghostly screams and crying of small girls. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Outside of fairy tales, sometimes the monsters are real. On June 13, 1977, Camp Scott, a Girl Scout camp that was located in the wooded hills near Locust Grove, Oklahoma, opened for its 49th season, the season that would turn out to be its last. At some point in the dark of the night, three young campers were brutally murdered in their tent. The bodies were discovered by a counselor the next morning. It became a summer of horror and tragedy, and it left behind a mystery that has never been solved, as well as an abandoned camp about which stories of ghosts and hauntings are told. But Camp Scott did not start off to be a grim and eerie place. Before that terrible night in 1977, it was a magical place for girls who came there for summer retreats. It had offered hiking, crafting, swimming, and much more for Brownies and Girl Scouts since 1928. Its 410 acres accommodated 140 campers and 20 staff members in picturesque log cabins and tents. The Cookie Trail Road led to 10 camping sites that were scattered throughout the woods. The girls were all assigned camp buddies to share tents with. The campsites were bases made from wood and covered with a 14 by 12 foot canvas tent. Inside were two bunk beds with mattresses. There were no other amenities, including lights. Aside from the campers' flashlights, the only source of light at night was a kerosene lantern that hung above the nearby latrines. The tent that was furthest from the counselor's unit was Kiawa Tent. In June 1977, it was a temporary home to three young girls, Lori Lee Farmer, 8, Michelle Guse, 9, and Doris Denise Milner, 10. On the previous day, the girls had boarded a bus in Tulsa for the 40-mile trip east to Camp Scott for a two-week stay. When they had kissed their parents goodbye that morning, no one could have known that they would never see them again. Denise, the oldest of the girls, was a straight-A student who had never been to camp before. This year, however, she had sold enough Girl Scout cookies during the annual drive to finally be able to attend. At first, Denise had been very excited because all her friends also planned to attend. Unfortunately, at the last minute, they had all backed out, leaving Denise hesitant about attending alone. Her mother finally convinced her to go, assuring her that she would make new friends at camp. Both Lori and Michelle had attended camp before. The youngest girl, Lori, had recently been considering attending a YMCA-sponsored camp instead of Camp Scott. She couldn't make a decision, so her mother decided for her. Lori would go to Camp Scott. She'd heard wonderful things about the place. Needless to say, it was an innocent decision that she'd regret. Michelle had been to Camp Scott the previous year and had a great time. She couldn't wait to go back. 
Her mother, Georgianne, later recalled, she was very excited and she came downstairs and she sat on my lap and told me she was going to miss me. When the girls arrived at Camp Scott, they found themselves assigned to be camp buddies. None of them had ever met before, but they soon became friends. They were assigned to Kiawa Tent, which was technically number seven on the roster, but was also referred to as number eight when the counselor's tent was included in the count. Kiawa Tent included a fourth bunk, and it's been said that a fourth girl was preparing to move to the tent that night, but because of bad weather, her move was postponed until the next day. The thunderstorm undoubtedly saved the fourth girl's life. It also put a damper on evening activities at the camp. The girls had eaten dinner in the Great Hall at 6 p.m. Afterward, they sang songs on the porch until 7 p.m., but were sent to their tents early when the storm moved in. At some point that evening, an emotional and upset Denise wrote a letter to her mother to tell her how much she disliked the camp, how homesick she was, and that she wanted to come home. The letter, so heartbreaking in hindsight, read, Dear Mom, I don't like camp. It's awful. The first day it rained. I have three new friends named Glenda, Lori, and Michelle. Michelle and Lori are my roommates. Mom, I don't want to stay at camp for two weeks. I want to come home and see Cassie and everybody. Your loving child, Denise Milner. Aside from Denise, most of the girls were rowdy with excitement on that first night. There was a lot of giggling, talking, and loud laughter. Things didn't settle down until almost 1.30 a.m. when one of the tired counselors finally got everyone to quiet down. Hiawatent was already silent. The three girls staying there had fallen asleep hours before. It was a remote campsite, far from the laughter and the noise of the other tents. It's generally believed that this tent was specifically targeted by the killers for no other reason than its secluded and dark location. At some point after the camp grew quiet, Counselor Carla Wilhite was awakened by some sort of strange sound in the darkness. It was a cross between a frog and a bullhorn or something, she later said. It was low and kind of guttural. It wasn't a language. It didn't seem like a language. It didn't seem human. It didn't sound like any animal I've heard. Carla awoke another counselor in her tent, D. Elder, and asked if she had heard the strange sound. She hadn't. Carla tried to go back to sleep, but she couldn't. Finally, she grabbed a flashlight and went outside to survey the nearby woods. She looked around but saw nothing. She paused, listening for the weird sound to return, but all was quiet. She took a quick walk toward the closest tents, but nothing seemed amiss, so she returned to her bunk. It was later reported that some of the campers also heard the guttural sounds in the darkness, Others reported a strange light that moved through the trees. Tent 6 was flooded with light, and then it disappeared. One camper also said that she heard a girl crying for her mother in the night. And there was more. Apparently, two counselors had been frightened by two men at the camp on the night before the murders. Several campers said they saw a man in army boots behind a tent. Another man was reportedly seen by a latrine on the night of the murders. Were these just stories told in the frightening days after the murders occurred, or were they warning signs that were missed? A warning sign like the letter that was found two months before the camp opened for the season. A few months prior to opening day, when counselors were assembled for a training session, someone ransacked a counselor's cabin and left behind a handwritten note in an empty donut box that warned that four girls would be murdered. If parents had been aware of this threat, it seems likely that many of the girls would not have been sent to camp that year. However, camp officials reported that they believed the note to be a prank and not a genuine threat. It's easy to understand why they wouldn't take it seriously. The camp had been operating for decades without any problems. It was believed to be a safe place. And as Camp Ranger Ben Woodward said after seeing the bodies of the murder victims, this is the reason why we moved to the country, to get away from crazy people. No one could have predicted the events of that terrible night. The next morning, around 6 a.m., Counselor Carla Wilhite was on her way to the showers and described seeing what she thought was luggage under some trees near Kiowa Tent. 
When she got closer, though, she realized that it wasn't luggage. It was bloody sleeping bags. Inside of the sleeping bags were the three girls from Kiala tent, Denise, Michelle, and Lori. They had been pulled from their tent, beaten, strangled, sexually assaulted, and left for dead. Two of them were stuffed inside of their sleeping bags. The third was left partially clothed on the trail nearby. All three of them were naked from the waist down and had been cruelly bound by two-inch wide electrical tape. The tape had also been placed over their mouths, muffling any cries for help or pleas for mercy. A cord had been tied tightly around each of their necks. The subsequent autopsy confirmed that Denise had died from strangulation. Michelle and Lori had both been bludgeoned to death. All three of them had been sexually assaulted. Inside of the tents were two blood-soaked mattresses, and there was so much blood that it had seeped through the mattresses and onto the wooden floor. Michelle and Lori had been beaten to death inside of the tent. The killer had then pulled them outside while still inside of their sleeping bags. Even more disturbingly, he had taken Denise outside to where her two friends lay and then strangled her to death. The girls had been killed during an act of senseless, inhuman violence, and no one else in the camp heard a thing. There were several large footprints on the wooden platform leading away from the tent, much too large to be those of any of the girls. The blood on the tent floor had been smeared. The killer had apparently used mattress covers and towels to try and clean things up, making prints difficult to read. A red six-volt flashlight and a roll of the same electrical tape that was used to bind the girls was discovered at the crime scene. A piece of tape had been used to wrap newspaper over the front of the flashlight, reducing the beam to a narrow shaft of light so that it wouldn't be seen from other parts of the camp. The police speculated that the flashlight had been left behind because the killer remained at Camp Scott until nearly dawn, when he could easily see to escape. The wooden platform, tent, flashlight, and tape were sent to the State Crime Bureau headquarters for further analysis. But as Mays County District Attorney Sid Wise stated, logic leads us to conclude that the murderer is a man, a stealthy, physically agile man. After the bodies of the girls were discovered, the camp directors, Barbara and Richard Day, alerted the highway patrol. Law enforcement officers flocked to the scene. Many of the hardened men, fathers themselves, were moved to tears. One officer later recalled that the scene was like being in church. People were talking in low whispers. They were quiet. I don't even recall birds singing. The police personnel at Kiawa Tent spoke in a whisper, and they silently collected evidence from the scene. Camp counselors woke the rest of the Girl Scouts and told them to pack. They were going home. None of them were told what had happened, but all knew something was wrong. They were put on buses that morning and sent back to Tulsa, not knowing why they were being sent away. The news of the murders slowly filtered out, but the names of the victims were not released, so parents had no idea if their daughters would be stepping off the bus or not. When authorities came to the Guse home to speak with Dick and Georgianne, they said that Michelle had been in an accident. It was only later, while watching television, that they learned how she had met her death. The entire region was stunned. Anyone who hadn't been locking their doors at night quickly decided to do so. There was a Boy Scout camp, Camp Garland, operating just three miles from Camp Scott. They quickly added a number of security measures to keep the campers safe. But the authorities assured the public there was no reason to panic. District Attorney Wise released a statement just days after the murders. I want to impress on you that we fully expect to break this case and bring the killer to justice. Sadly, this expectation turned out to be untrue. The grisly search of the crime scene led to an extensive manhunt in the rough terrain of the area. The small town of Locust Grove, the closest community to the camp, was in the heart of the Cookson Hills, the southernmost extension of the Boston Mountains and part of the Ozark Plateau. The entire region was covered in thick timber, and the inhabitants, who came after the Cherokee Indians, eked out a meager living through farming for generations. Thanks to the rugged mountains and forests of the area, it became a hideout for Oklahoma outlaws and bank robbers in the 1920s and 1930s, including Charles Arthur Pretty Boy Floyd. It was a place in which it was easy for a man to disappear. But law enforcement officials were not giving up. 
They brought in specially trained dogs from Philadelphia to try and pick up a scent and trace the killer. Within a week, the dogs led investigators to a small cave that was about a mile from Camp Scott. Inside, they found several empty food tins, tape, eyeglasses, and a piece of newspaper that was from the same edition as the piece discovered with the flashlight left next to the girls' bodies. They also discovered an old photograph of two women that had been taken at a wedding. In the hope that someone could identify the women in the photo, it was restored by lab technicians and published in newspapers across the state. The subjects in the photograph were eventually identified as guests from a 1969 wedding of a prison employee's daughter. An inmate had worked as a darkroom assistant at the time of the wedding, and the authorities believed that he'd printed the image. The inmate was a 33-year-old Cherokee man who had been serving a 10-year sentence for the kidnapping and rape of a pregnant woman. After his release, he was arrested again for burglary, but he'd escaped from jail in 1973. Since then, there had been no trace of Jean Leroy Hart, but that didn't stop the district attorney from immediately filing charges against him for murder. Even though there was no direct evidence against him, the public was demanding results, so an arrest warrant was issued. Now all they had to do was find him. A search party made up of more than 60 officers, including an FBI tactical squad and three special state squads, began combing the dense countryside. Bounty hunters traveled from across the state to join in the search, along with hundreds of volunteers like Michelle Guse's father. There were few roads and trails in the Cookson Hills, which was the perfect hideout for someone like Hart, who they discovered was skilled in wilderness survival. There was plenty of fish and wild game in the region, so Hart wouldn't go hungry. He definitely had the upper hand, but the officers and volunteers were driven and began scouring the forest. Motivated by revenge? perhaps, but anger also played a part in the seriousness of the task. This was especially true after the searchers discovered a derisive message that was scrawled in a cave near Camp Scott. The killer was here. Bye-bye, fools, it read. As the public learned that it was Gene Hart that the authorities were looking for, many of them came out in support of the well-known former Pryor High School football star. They believed he was innocent of the murders and protested on his behalf. Cookouts and fund drives were held to raise money for his defense. It was widely believed that Hart was innocent and that the murders had been blamed on him because the authorities had been embarrassed by his 1973 escape and because they had been unable to solve the Camp Scott murders. A member of AIM, the American Indian Movement Organization, spoke to newspaper reporters and stated that Hart told him that he didn't kill the girls but was afraid of what would happen to him if he surrendered. He was convinced that he would be killed. But not everyone believed in Hart's claims of innocence. To many in the community, the facts that the ex-convict refused to turn himself in made him look guilty. Others, though, were simply terrified of the fact that there was still a monster out there, whoever he was, who had brutalized and murdered three little girls. Doors were double-locked, and no children were allowed to play outside after dark. Hart managed to avoid the police in the Cookson Hills for 10 months before being captured in April 1978. He was hiding out in an isolated cabin with a man named Sam Pigeon Jr., and when the authorities showed up at the door, he surrendered without a fight. He'd been tracked down after the police received the tip that there was someone living with an old man who lived by himself in a rural area who cut wood and received some type of check. The checks turned out to be the social security checks and were traced to Pigeon. Hart had been living with him in the cabin since November 1977. No one had ever come around to look. Hart was arrested and, ironically, was locked up in the same jail he had once escaped from while he awaited trial. On April 11, 1978, hundreds of spectators crammed into the courthouse as Hart made his appearance in court. With his attorney, Garvin A. Isaacs, next to him, he entered a plea of not guilty. A preliminary hearing was held on June 7th. During the first week, an array of witnesses took the stand, including camp counselors Carla Wilhite and D. Elder, both of whom detailed the first night at camp and the discovery of the bodies the following morning. Lewis Lindsay, the records clerk at the Oklahoma State Reformatory who took the wedding photographs found in the cave, took the stand on the third day and explained how Hart was granted permission to work in the darkroom, developing photographs. 
His opinion of Hart was that he was a trustworthy man and a hard worker. Hubert Earl Maxey, a chemist and physicist, took the stand on the seventh day. He compared hair samples taken from Hart with the hair samples found at the crime scene. The prosecution tried to state that they were the same, but Maxey disagreed. He stated, the only opinion I could form was that they looked similar. That's about as far as it goes. There's nothing that would show that it would belong to any particular individual. I'll remind the reader that DNA evidence and testing did not yet exist in the late 1970s, so there was no way to say if the hair matched for sure. Crime scene technicians were also unable to test the semen samples that had been found inside two of the girls so they could be matched to anyone definitively. It's hard to say what would have been discovered if this could have been done. Hart had had a vasectomy. Would the samples have matched or not? The preliminary trial was the longest in Oklahoma history. In the end, Judge Jess Clayton ordered Hart to be tried on first-degree murder charges. The defense would have nearly eight months to build their case. And they would have the support of Hart's family members and many of the people of the community who continued to believe that he was innocent. Money had been raised for his defense, and there was a vocal outpouring of support but there was still the fact that Hart was a rapist, a kidnapper, and was known for being violent. The evidence in the cave seemed to link him to the camp, even though nothing at the murder scene could be directly tied to him. The trial was held in Pryor, Oklahoma, Hart's hometown, and began on March 5, 1978. The attorneys for the state announced that they would be seeking the death penalty. It took 11 days to seat a jury of six men and six women who would not be shown the most graphic photographs of the three dead girls that had been taken at the crime scene. The judge ruled them to be too prejudicial to the defense. Some of them, including images of the bound and beaten at the camp and on the autopsy table, still made it into the trial, much to the dismay of Garvin Isaacs, Hart's attorney. Hart's mother, Ella Mae Buckskin, was in court during every day of the trial, as was Sharon Farmer, Lori's mother, Mrs. Farmer made it a point to tell reporters that she assumed Hart to be guilty. Someone has hurt our family, she said. Someone has taken our daughter from us. One of the more perplexing pieces of evidence presented at the trial was the discovery of a small hand mirror and a corn cob pipe. Karen Mitchell, a counselor at Camp Scott, identified the items as ones that went missing from a trunk that she had brought with her to camp. Karen hadn't noticed that they'd vanished until the trunk was returned to her by the police a few weeks after they'd confiscated it for examination. According to investigators, they had been seized from the cabin that Hart had been hiding out in. However, they did admit that they had not been found until after his preliminary hearing. Defense attorney Isaacs argued they just as easily could have been planted by the police. And then things got weirder. Mays County Jailer Alan R. Little took the stand to talk about the wedding photograph that had been discovered in the cave. He made a shocking statement. He had seen the exact photograph on Mays County Sheriff Pete Weaver's desk more than three years before the murders. So how did the photograph end up in the cave if it had not been in Gene Hart's possession in the first place? Garvin Isaacs also managed to produce statements that clearly showed that the footprint that was found outside the girl's tent didn't match Hart's, and neither did a thumbprint that had been found on the flashlight. You can't change your fingerprints or shrink your feet, Isaacs said. The defense also produced another suspect in the murders, one that had never been investigated by the police. His name was William Stevens, and he was a convicted rapist from Kansas. One of the Girl Scouts who had been at the camp that night, Kimberly Lewis, 11, took the stand and identified Stevens as the man she had seen outside her tent with a flashlight. That looks like the man, she said. He had on a blue jacket. We heard a noise and one of the girls lifted the tent flap and shined her flashlight in his face. Joyce Payne, the wife of a friend of William Stevens, also testified. She said that Stevens had borrowed a flashlight identical to the one found at the crime scene from her, claiming that she was going fishing. She noted that the flashlight found at the camp had the same distinctive scratches around the lens as the one that she had loaned to Stevens. Sure, that's my flashlight, she said, when she was shown the flashlight that had been submitted into evidence. It was given to me by my son. There were probably thousands of flashlights just like that one sold in Oklahoma at the time, 
so her identification could have easily been mistaken. However, the testimony that followed from her son was chilling. Larry Short, Joyce's son, also identified the flashlight and then went on to describe a visit that Stevens had made to his home in Oak Mulgee on the day after the bodies of the girls were found. He recalled that Stevens had claw marks on his arms and neck, as well as red stains on his boots. The jury acquitted Hart after just one hour of deliberation. Once the trial was over, the jurors were very critical of the investigation. As one said to a reporter, in several places it seemed their investigation was so slipshod, I mean a layman could have done better. Another noted that it tore a lot of confidence I had in the judicial system. But one juror made sure that the reason for the acquittal was clear. The prosecution had simply not made a case that Hart was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The decision was not made to clear Hart. They felt the heinous crime must have been committed by more than one person. I'm not saying that he's not guilty, the juror said, but I'm saying that the evidence showed that not one person did it by themselves. We all twelve agreed on that. When the verdict was announced, Gene Hart placed his head in his hands and began to sob while his family and friends applauded. Their celebration was short-lived, however. Hart was immediately transported back to prison to finish out his previous sentence, as well as additional time for his escape. Two months later, he died from a sudden heart attack while exercising in the prison yard. A considerable number of Oklahomans felt that the real killer had successfully eluded capture because the police had been so focused on capturing Gene Hart and pinning the murders on him. Were they right? Or had Hart somehow fooled the jury? Or worse, had Hart been involved in the murders with someone else? Someone who was still out there? After Hart's acquittal, the families of Lori Farmer and Doris Milner attempted to sue the owners of Camp Scott for negligence, but were unsuccessful, leading to more disappointment and heartbreak. Over the years, as technology has changed, the evidence in the Camp Scott murders has been tested and tested again. Unfortunately, all the tests have proven inconclusive, and it's likely that it will never point to any one suspect. Sadly, the murders will probably never be solved. No Girl Scouts ever again walked the trails or slept in the tents at Camp Scott. It never reopened after the murders. It was essentially abandoned as it stood and remains out in the woods, serving as an eerie reminder of a terrible tragedy and the stolen lives of three little girls. It also serves as a reminder about the ongoing mystery of the killer who was never caught and of the other mysteries that are still whispered about when it comes to this case. That the ruins of Camp Scott are rumored to be haunted should come as no surprise to the reader. This is a place of horror and tragedy, and there are many who believe that the terrible events of June 1977 are still echoing at the camp. It's not so much a lingering spirit, it's believed, but rather a sinister recording of the murders replaying itself over time. There have been reports of a shadowy figure and disembodied footsteps that are heard when no living person is around, but more common are the accounts of screams, cries, and the soul-wrenching sound of a girl weeping in the shadows. Those who have dared to venture out to the abandoned remains of the camp never linger there for long. And there are other stories that are still told about the murders, stories much stranger than ghosts. Almost from the time of his arrest, rumors swirled about Gene Hart. Despite the support of his family, friends, and some of the people from his hometown, many people still believed that he was somehow involved in the murders. He was acquitted, they said, only because the prosecution did not prove its case, not because the jury felt he was innocent. There are still many who believe that Hart killed the three girls and that he did not act alone and then things get a little stranger after that. The rumors claimed that Hart was a member of an old Cherokee society called the Kitawa, a group dedicated to keeping old tribal customs and rituals alive in the modern day. Hart apparently considered himself part of this group, although there is some question about his acceptance by valid members of the society. Regardless, there are some who believe that Hart tried to gain acceptance into the society to learn traditional Cherokee spirituality, tribal rituals, 
and what would be considered magic. In one of the last newspaper interviews that he gave before his death, he referred to his belief as a blend of Christianity and our ancient and traditional Cherokee religion. Does this mean that he was some sort of shaman? Not necessarily, but it's possible that Hart believed that he was. And so did a lot of other people. During the investigation, detectives reported that many strange events occurred. It was discovered that Hart had been under the counsel of a Cherokee medicine man during his time in hiding. He already possessed the nickname of the Sandman for his allegedly shape-shifting skills. In the religion and culture lore of many Native American tribes, there are legends of shapeshifters or skinwalkers, people who have the ability to change their physical appearance at will. This was how some believed that Hart was able to commit crimes and stay hidden from the authorities for as long as he did. While Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation agent Harvey Pratt was working undercover on the Camp Scott case, he heard from various people, including deputies at the Mays County Jail, that Hart had the ability to change his form and to shapeshift into an animal. One jailer told Pratt that Hart often taunted and laughed at him, telling him that he was able to slip through the bars of his cell and escape. And in fact, Hart did escape, twice from the Mays County Jail in Pryor. The first time, he cut through the bars of his cell with a hacksaw blade, but with the second attempt, well, the details have never been made clear. Stranger still, detectives reported that while they were investigating the scene at Camp Scott, they often saw a black dog in the woods that would follow them to various places in the camp and then mysteriously disappear. There were some who believed that this dog was Hart, watching the investigation while in a different form. Sounds ridiculous? Perhaps, but a lot of people believed it then and some still do. Several people who have visited the abandoned property in recent years still report seeing a black dog wandering around the camp. Could it be, as some have suggested, the spirit of Gene Hart still haunting the grounds after all these years, perhaps trapped in a place where he took part in one of Oklahoma's most heinous crimes? Camp Scott was sold off by the Girl Scouts in the 1980s and is now located on private property. Many of the old buildings still stand today, dilapidated and overtaken by nature. This is a haunted place by both the spirits and the events of the past. Visitors are not welcome at what used to be Camp Scott, but some people trespass there anyway. If you are among them, remember that this is a place where a horror was visited on three little girls and stunned an entire generation of children. Treat this place and their memories with respect. And if you see a black dog walking around, consider that a warning to leave. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Minds, MeWe, and the show's Weirdos Facebook group on the contact social page at weirddarkness.com. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, click on Tell Your Story or call the Dark Line toll-free at one 877 277 5944. That's 1 877 277 5944. And if you're listening on the radio, be sure to also subscribe to the podcast where I upload episodes seven days a week. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. 1977 Girl Scout Massacre was written by Troy Taylor from his book. Suffer the Children, America's Horrors, Homicides, and Hauntings, available on Amazon, which I have linked to in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production of Marler House Productions, copyright Weird Darkness 2021. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. And a final thought. 
stay close to people who feel like sunlight. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.